Welcome, everybody. Well, you're 30 Thanks. seconds late. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't find the link. I'm so sorry. Uh, well, here we are, everybody. So, Carla, you look beautiful. Take it away. I figured I'd actually do my hair and makeup for once since. <laughs> Carla, whenever you're ready. Okay, Jennifer, are we waiting for other people to join or should we just get going? We have all the speakers, right? We have, uh, yeah. I see Brenda, Senora Brigitte, uh, Mr. David, yeah. Andy Trosper, thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Monica Fox, beautiful, thank you very much. They're, they're all here, we're all here, so I think we should start if you guys are and then people can start joining Ready. so uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us today my name is Carla Martinez and I serve as the co-chair to the Latino work group of the Association of Multi Multicultural Affairs in Transplantation and I am a program manager at Southwest Transplant Alliance I would like to begin with a few housekeeping items if you haven't done so already, please mute your phones um, if you're not speaking and please turn off your camera during the panel um, if you are not a panelist. You will be able uh, to ask questions uh, of the panelists at the end of the program. If you, if you would like to ask a question, you may write it in the chat or ask it when we open up for questions at the end. I would also like to let you know that the panel is being recorded today. I want to acknowledge and thank our committee members responsible for bringing this great group of people together to share their stories. Wave, committee, <laughs> they'll be introducing all of our speakers. Um, we are happy to present to you today, Mi Casa Es Tu Casa, in honor of Hispanic Heritage Month. The observation of Hispanic Heritage Month in the United States started in 1968 and was enacted into law in 1988. The day of September 15th is significant because it is the anniversary of independence for Latin American countries, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. In addition, Mexico and Chile celebrate their Independence Day on September 16th and September 18th. Americans observe Hispanic Heritage Month from September 15th to October 15th by celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, Central and South America. The stories shared with you today will not only be of Latinos, but of families from a variety of ethnic groups. During these difficult times that our country is currently enduring, we're coming together and inviting you into our homes and into our familia to celebrate diversity and hear inspirational stories about donation and transplantation. So welcome, mi casa su casa. And now I'm going to to uh, tee it off to Carlos Castro, Education Specialist at LifeLink Foundation, um, who will be introducing our first speaker. Carlos? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carlos Castro. I work with LifeLink Foundation here in Georgia since 2005. It's been a long way, almost 16 years, working with the Hispanic community, trying to spread our mission among the people who speak Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, this afternoon, I want to start this conversation with uh, some numbers, some statistics related to donation and transplants. Uh, the first good news is in, two, in 2019, we had an increase of around 9% if we compare with the previous year, 2018. That, that means a lot. Almost 9% in these difficult times is very, very interesting. In 2019, the total of transplants was almost 40,000 transplants. That not necessarily means there were 40,000 donors, because you, you, all of you know, one donor can generate more than one transplant until eight transplants from one donor. So that is 
that is the, the reason I am trying to clarify that 40,000 transplants not necessarily means 40,000 donors. The number of donors uh, that we had to reach this record was 12,000 deceased donors and 7,400 living donors. It was really, really a spectacular numbers. In this year, we were really very, very concerned because the pandemic and the difficult times all the world is going through. But we have another very, very interesting good news. Since January the 1st through August the 30th, so taking in consideration the first eight months of the year, we have already surpassed the number of donors during all 2018 year long. <clears throat> in the same period, from January to August, we have reached 25,600 transplants, which is another, another record. However, still we have a huge number of people in need of a life-saving transplants. The current number in the United States is over 110,000 people waiting for, for an organ transplant and almost uh, around 68,000 are already placed in the waiting list. Now, to complete this information, this statistics number, I want to remind you something. Uh, in a perspective of the last 20 years, from year 2000 to 2020, the number of Hispanic disease donors increased. In 2000, we had 620. In this year, 2020, so far, we have 1,235. So in these two decades, we could make more than double of people in base of public education and being very active with the community. Uh, at this point, if we compare the ethnic groups, the Hispanic is the group that had the <clears throat> biggest growth in this part. Uh, in the year 2000, the percent of Hispanic donors was only 10%, and now we are in a 15.6%, which is uh, more than 50%, talking about in abstract numbers. <clears throat> the number of uh, Hispanic recipients also grow very fast. In 2000, we had 2,500 Hispanic recipients. In 2020, we have 4,300. So that is an increase of 72%, which is a very, very good goal as well. Uh, this means that more Hispanics are being placed in the waiting list, are getting the benefit of the transplant. And that is a good point that we can, of course, use to encourage the people on donation. Well, uh, I hope this number is, is really a good inspiration, a good motivation. We have a very positive numbers of Hispanics in all the United States. We are very proud of these. Now, uh, I want to introduce Mr. David and Mrs. Bridget Hopkins, the parents of a really, really real hero, Danny Hopkins. They will tell us about their, their experience on the donation process and how they face the experience to donate, to make a positive decisions. Please welcome David and Bridget Hopkins. Thank you so much for being here with us. Go ahead. Thank you, Thank you Carlos. The, uh, we're, we're happy to be here and happy to be a part of this. Um, the, uh, our son, Danny, uh, he passed away a little over four years ago and um, was, you know, when people pass away, the, um, whether they're a, a perceived as a, being a good person or a bad person, they are regardless, the mere fact that they've passed away, all of a sudden they're, they're, they're spoke of as 
you know, maybe as saints. Yeah, Danny was. The, uh, he truly was an incredible the, uh, young man. Uh, he doted on his mother. The, uh, he, he loved Jesus. The, uh, he would he'd just walk up to strangers. And in fact, we had to talk to him sometimes, you know, hey, just make sure that we're there, <laughs> you know, but just on his own, just walk up to him, man, I love your hat. You know, where'd you get that? I mean, just, just so sweet. The, uh, so incredibly talented. And, um, you know, our experience with uh, LifeLink, um, although for me, it didn't start off the, uh, very well. Um, the, uh, the night that Danny passed away, it was very late. And um, the, uh, um, unbeknownst to me, Bridget had already spoken with um, a nurse at the hospital, and I guess they contacted LifeLink. But um, I, was, I was unaware of that. And I, I was I got a phone call and, you know, I, I just, I guess, suffice to say, I, I, I was, uh, I was, I was rude, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but, you know, remembered that they had talked about uh, organ do donation the, um, a couple of years earlier. And uh, Danny became aware of it, I guess, with her driver's license, you know, seeing an organ donor and asked what that was. But the, um, you know, I'd say that that's critical that, you know, those kinds of discussions are, are made, you know, as early as possible the, uh, to avoid, you know, that type of conversation in, in such a traumatic, the horrible uh, situation as, as was the case with us, as it was a horrible accident. But, uh, but anyway, I know Danny would be looking down from heaven and um, very, very proud that uh, he was able to, to affect the uh, other people's lives the, uh, with the uh, organ donation. But, uh, I mean, he was, uh, we have a really smart kids and they have an IQ of 124 and 123. They were really smart me. <laughs> because of me. <laughs> and um, in our culture, we never talk about uh, organ donor. I knew about organ donor because of my driver's license. So we start talking about our kids in an early time about the organ donors and what that means in our family and everything. So when this happened, we already had the decision done. And it was easy for us. I mean, it was a hard time and a better easy decision because we know what he wants. So for us, he's a hero to do that. And um, we may come, I want to, say something that uh, because of this donation, we make a TV interview and a newspaper and radio. And I wanna say that because of this one family in Colombia uh, decided to donate his organs. And his name is Oscar Daniel Rodriguez Abril. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a picture of him. His family make a donation um, of his organ, he's another hero. Um, but we wanna to touch uh, many hearts with this interview and let the people know about how important it is to talk with the families about this uh, important. Um, we save life, my son saved four lives. We wish we could make more. And I know he's proud, he's proud of this, right? So, thank you, Lifeline. Thank you so much for this interview and for this opportunity. <clears throat> David and, and Bridget, for sharing your experience with us. Um, Danny is an inspiration, and, and like Carlos said, he is truly a hero. Um, oh, yeah. Go ahead. We have a picture here. <laughs> oh, what a great photo. Yeah, he was amazing. He loved to do uh, experiments, project science. I mean, he made his um, list for Christmas list and he asked him for metal detectors or microscope or things Tools. like that. And duct tape, he loved to do duct tape. But thank you so much, really, for this opportunity. And these are angels. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, and now Ingrid Palacio, uh, who is the chair of this committee, and she's a community outreach coordinator at New England Donor Services, will introduce her next. 
our speaker. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, Bridget and David, for sharing such an inspiring and beautiful story. Um, it really warms my heart to know that your son lives on and leaves this legacy that we can continue talking about and inspiring other people like um, this beautiful gentleman in Colombia that also become an organ donor in, in, in honor to, to your son, knowing uh, the story, and then how many people can can change and find their in their hearts to help um, save lives through organ and tissue donation by hearing your story. Thank you so much for being so brave. I know this is not something easy to talk about, but it's something so necessary. We admire you, we honor you, and we thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. Um, so I today I'm going to be presenting my my dear friend, who has become a dear friend, Pong, he's um, a new, a fairly new, no super new volunteer with us at New England Donor Services, and his story is very inspirational, and he's alive today because a family like the Hopkins has said yes uh, to uh, organ donation. Very briefly, um, for sake of time, I want to mention some important facts about organ donation in the Asian community in the United States. Just want to mention that um, about 9% of the people waiting in the waiting list, um, so a, a little over 10,000 people in the waiting list um, are Asian and that are waiting for a life saving transplant. Last year in 2019, at least about 6% uh, of the people that donate, the, that receive organs were Asian and um, like our, our next speaker. Um, and in the kidney waiting list that we, that the majority of people that are in the waiting list are waiting for a kidney. We have that in that list, which is almost close to 100,000. Uh, we have the 10% of that list um, were also Asian. And so, and in 2019, the living donors, the living Asian donors and the deceased Asian donors were also kind of, kind of in the, in the same, in the same number. And so I want to um, say that it's very important because this is a community that is in need of organs, but because of sometimes cultural uh, barriers or beliefs, um, we don't get to, to, to talk about organ donation or, or expose this community about organ donation. This is why today we wanted to embrace all these ethnicities. So we have this frank conversation and, and have this powerful story that is my honor to present with you guys, Venara Pong. Pong, take it away. Hi everyone, um, you can call me Pong. Um, thank you so much for having me and thank you Ingrid for introducing me. So um, um, I, I am a lung transplant patient and just to take you back a little bit um, what my background is, what my story is. So my family moved here to the United States, to Massachusetts um, when I was nine years old from Cambodia. And um, I was very sick. I was a very sick child. I was around nine years old, like I said. And um, I had this disease called pulmonary arterial hypertension. And what this disease is, is it's a rare genetic disease that affect my heart and my lung. Um, the first two years was relatively stable. I was fortunate to see a, a specialist at Children's Hospital in Boston and they, you know, were able to like stabilize my condition for, for the, the first few years. But then uh, my lung and my heart decided to give up on me. And on one morning, it was like a week before Thanksgiving, you know, happy time and it wasn't, so I, I cough up a lot of blood, and um, you know they they want they couldn't stop the bleeding, so they put me in a coma, which was at that time was the only way to to keep me alive for the time being. Um, so I, I really couldn't remember except for I was coughing blood, and then I was like saying goodbye to my family just in case I I just just to make sure you know if I don't make it because it. You know, the, the, the para paramedic, when they saw me, like, yeah, they just shake their head. It's like, we don't know what to do. So um, they put me in coma and then I slept for like 14 days. And, um, you know, my doctor was like, fought for me. Like, they, they like, oh, he need a new, a new pair of lung. 
and and a new a new heart as well. And um, for some, so it's like my story is like one of this, either it's like a miracle or I or it's I just got very lucky. I I like to think that I got very lucky. Um, I pulled on the breathing tube for some reason, and um, I I woke up from that, and um, you know, and my doctor was like you know guess what we we got you uh, a, a new pair of lung and um we're gonna have to wait to see if we're gonna get you a heart too because it just everything is just kind of all messed up you know and um so i got a lung and I asked when they opened me up another miraculous story is that my heart start to like kind of rehab rehabilitate itself like it's start to um generate and fix itself in some way um and you know they they decided it might it might be worth it to just keep waiting and see if if I improve um, after my lung transplant and 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 I did and um it wasn't like you know like a snap of the finger I got better but it was a long difficult journey for sure in terms of recovery um but um you know it changed my life forever and um and here I am. <laughs> be able to pursue everything that I want to do in, in life. Um, you know, I always, because I grew up around medicine so much and being so sick, um, my interest in medicine just continued to develop and um, in, in medical research. And, um, you know, I was able to, to go on to finish high school, you know, earn good grades, go to a very good college. And um, now I'm applying to medical school and, you know, doing research in medical research. <laughs> and, um, you know, looking back, just like I said, I either it was a miracle or I got very lucky. And I, I just think I got very lucky. And, um, and the reason why I want to go into medicine is that it, I feel like I can do some good, um, not just um, for my, my life goal, but because of where I come from, you know, my community. Um, I grew up in a very diverse school community and, you know, growing up here and having to go into Boston in and out, it wasn't very easy for, for our family, especially the first, the first few years when we came here. And um, my, my hope is that I, I can do this um, and, and do some, some good in my community. So that's why I, wanna, I want to pursue this goal and, and do as much as I can in, do everything I can in my power to to help save other people, and um, that is my 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 life goal and and my journey. Um, and um, yeah, that's you know I'm happy to uh, really really happy to share this story with all of you. And um, yeah, thank you for having me again. I appreciate it. Thank you for being with us, Tong. Um, that really is an inspirational story, and. I know that you will do a lot of really amazing things um, with, with your future. Uh, we are definitely going to be looking out and seeing what kind of stuff you come up with. <laughs> Thank you again for sharing your story. Um, next up, we have Jennifer Aguilar, who is the Community Outreach Specialist at Gift of Hope Organ and Tissue Donor Network. Jennifer, can you please introduce our next uh, speaker? Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ms. Monica Fox, who is a kidney recipient. Um, and I just wanted to give some facts about donation in the African-American community here in the United States. Due to high rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, and heart disease, the Black community has increased risk of developing kidney failure. 31,000 patients on the organ transplant waiting list this year are Black. Of those patients, 29,000 are waiting for a kidney. In 2020, 5,000 transplant recipients uh, were Black, and 1,298 organ donors uh, were Black. So uh, again, I'm so excited to have Ms. Monica Fox share her story with us of her uh, kidney um, experience. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm just honored to be a part of this panel. And before I get started, I just want to say to the Hopkins family, thank you so much 
for your precious gift and and as a kidney transplant recipient i am so grateful to you and i love you and i want to say to pong i believe in miracles and yours was a miracle i had a miracle in my life as well and i spent uh about 14 days in the icu myself at the beginning of my illness um many of those days i was in an induced coma and woke up having had my first dialysis treatment and um my doctor told me i needed a transplant but i may never be healthy enough to get one and here i am today so i believe in miracles and you had one and so did i and i'm grateful about that um but i want to start my story off today well i want to say that i've been grateful too to be a volunteer for gift of hope since 2014. i have been um the director of their ambassador chapter in my area the south suburban chicago area and as well as um, being on their advisory council. And I have learned so much while I was on dialysis, I was actually volunteering for them. And I learned those startling statistics that Jennifer just named off. And I was like, oh my gosh, God put me in this position to make a difference and to do something. He gave somebody with a big mouth, a big problem. And here I am today. So. I really just want to start off by telling you about my friend Milton. Milton and I first met on the day before Thanksgiving in 2016 and we bonded instantly. We had a lot in common. Milton had a daughter and I had a daughter. They both were about the same age. Milton was African American and 53 years old and so was I. Um, actually, Milton is more than a friend. He's my hero because after being tragically injured in a car accident, he gave me the gift of, of life, of a directed deceased donor kidney. When Milton was alive, he gave blood regularly, and he told his family that he wanted to be an organ donor because he knew that he could save so many people. He told his mother, who he loved fiercely, and his mother was a fierce advocate for organ donation. So she, along with Milton's daughter, who was his legal next to kin at the young age of um, 23, um, and they made sure that during that most tragic time of their lives, that they called around to friends and loved ones to see if they knew anyone in need of a kidney or a liver. And they found me and they saved me. And I'm so grateful because, because they saved me, I'm now the director of outreach for the National Kidney Foundation of Illinois. And I'm able to educate people about the importance of living and deceased donation and about prevention. So let me share just a few important facts about kidney disease. Kidney disease is the eighth leading cause of death in Illinois and the ninth in the United States, and it's preventable, so that's tragic. Over 37 million people in Illinois have chronic kidney disease, in, in the United States have chronic kidney disease and 90% are unaware of it. Dialysis and transplant are two treatments for chronic kidney disease, and transplant is the best, giving patients the best outcomes and quality of life. High blood pressure and diabetes are the leading causes of chronic kidney disease, and therefore, people of Black and Latinx communities in America are the most likely to suffer with chronic kidney disease. These are the re reasons why prevention is key. Diet, nutrition, and exercise play a major role in preventing the progression of kidney disease and reducing the need for dialysis and transplant. But the most important, the most important thing is knowing. So it's important to get regular checkups and know your numbers. And at NKFI, we offer free kidney screenings all over the state of Illinois. So if anyone's interested in a free screening, they can go to our website, which is www.nkfi.org and see the list of screenings. Due to COVID, we have been limited, but now we've put some COVID regulations in place and we are getting back on the road um, doing kidney screenings. So my kidney transplant has allowed me to watch my nephew grow into an awesome baseball player now in high school. It has allowed me to collaborate with my daughter, Jennifer's colleague um, in outreach, because she's an outreach specialist for Gift of Hope. Um, I've traveled all over the country advocating for important issues impacting kidney and transplant patients. I've become a podcast host, 
Hosting the Journey Continues, a podcast that is committed to promoting kidney health and organ donation through powerful stories. I've been able to build a successful Mary Kay skincare business, and many of these things I never dreamed about doing, but due to the gift of organ donation from my hero, Milton, I'm truly living my best life. And in closing, I want to say that if you're not a registered organ donor, please consider registering today. And I just thank you guys so much for this opportunity to be a part of this amazing panel. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, I am sure Milton is looking down and so proud of you and all the wonderful things that you're doing because you are truly making a difference. Um, you know, making sure that our communities know the importance and the need of donation is so important. And so thank you so much for sharing and thank you for what you do on a daily basis. Next up, I would love to introduce our uh, colleague, Leslie Rodriguez. She is a multicultural outreach coordinator at Donor Network of Arizona. Uh, and Leslie will be introducing our next speaker. Thank you so much, Carla, and everyone here today. It's been wonderful hearing your stories. They really touched my heart. I am privileged to be able to introduce our next speaker, Brenda. And before doing so, I wanted to take the time to acknowledge some facts about Native American communities and cultures nationally. Um, we have spoken a little bit about um, kidneys and for many Native American communities, uh, they are four times more likely to get uh, diabetes and result in uh, kidney complications. In 2019, we had nationally 271 recipients of Native American background. And in 2020, nationally there has been 55 Native American, Alaskan Native deceased organ donors. Currently we have 957 Native Americans waiting for a transplant. 854 of them are waiting specifically for a kidney. It is my absolute pleasure to then introduce to you our next speaker who is a living kidney donor. Her name is Brenda and she does amazing opportunities and jobs in, the, in her community. Um, she is a school counselor at the Turtle Mountain Elementary School District in North Dakota. Um, so as you know, we are here advocating nationally. So though my, there's different communities in Arizona, we do want to join efforts and provide as many stories and information as we can. So it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Brenda to you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Brenda Wilkie, and I am an enrolled member of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians, located in Belcourt, North Dakota, way up north. We're really close to the Canadian border. Um, so my story starts back in 2000, in October 2007, um, my mother developed um, her, her kidneys failed her, so she started on dialysis in October of 2007. So um, she didn't like dialysis at all. It would drain her. She was so tired all the time, and she, she used to always say, I think they're over-dialysizing me. <laughs> but anyway, she, she was on dialysis, and in... July, uh, or in June of 2008, um, we made the appointment in Fargo, North Dakota, to do the testing um, to see if I would be able, if to see if I was a match for her. And I was the first one of the siblings. I, the, my parents had six kids, so I was the first to be tested. I'm the youngest, the baby girl, so. Um, I went first and turns out I was a, a perfect match for her. Um, we weren't scheduled to have surgery until, uh, the following year in 2009 in January, but in September or yeah, it was September. The transplant coordinator had called us and said they had, um, an opening 
or, or a cancellation or something. And it was around Thanksgiving in 2008. So we, we jumped on that. We, we did the transplant over, um, over Thanksgiving break that year. Um, and right away, my mom felt better. She felt 100% better. Um, she, I remember she didn't even need pain meds after that. She did feel guilty though. Um, I, I was in a lot of pain. Um, and it was, uh, probably the most excruciating pain that I've ever experienced, but I felt good about it. Um, I felt good that I was able to, to do that for my mom. Um, and she always, when she went for doctor's appointments, her, her kidney function, her creatinine levels were always like spot on. She had, and the doctor used to always, um, say, you, you have yourself a good, a good kidney there. Um, but let's see. So my mom passed this past July. Um, and it wasn't because of kidney failure. It was, she, she had some, um, uh, she had like a, a lump, like, not a lump, but a mass in one of her lungs and she developed pneumonia. So that, that's why she ended up passing. But in December of 2018, she went for a stent replacement, um, in Fargo and she ended up having a couple of heart attacks on the table. So <clears throat> it was kind of like a roller coaster this last 18 months or so, but uh, um, she was in a coma for uh, like three months after the, the heart attacks. And she kept, um, the doctor would come and say, okay, her kid, the, the kidney is failing. Um, and out of the blue, it would kick in. It kicked in, I bet you, three times they told us that her, that the kidney was failing. But like I said, um, I was, when, while talking with Leslie, I, I said, I, I have to give it to the prayers because I, even the doctors didn't realize or didn't understand why it kept coming back, but it, it, kept coming back and I we did an interview with a, a local newspaper after our kidney donation and the just to kind of bring awareness um, because there's we are fortunate we have a kidney dialysis center here in Belcourt so our people don't have to travel you know hours to for dialysis but um, just to bring awareness that there aren't a lot of people that that do live, you know, live donations around this area. And I don't, I don't know why, but I remember the, the journalist asking, you know, if, um, I had, can't really remember the, the exact question, but, um, like some native communities, they believe that they should be, uh, buried whole that it's not supposed to be um that you're not supposed to give away your parts what we'll say but and i just told him well she's she's my mother um there was no doubt in my mind that i wouldn't i that i wouldn't do it um and i feel very grateful that i was able to give her life for 12 more years um she got to see many more grandchildren be born um and she she enjoyed she enjoyed family and um i guess that's that's my story thank you brenda first and foremost um i'm so sorry for your for your loss um what what great 12 years i'm sure your mother lived uh, with her grandchildren and, and being to live because of the gift that you gave. So you are a true hero. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story.
And Ingrid Palacios is going to go ahead and introduce our um, our last, last but not least. Go ahead. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, Brenda, Mrs. Fox, and everybody. I mean, this is so inspiring. I feel so re-energized. Um, we as a country are going through so much and a lot of us are mourning and aching on, on, on the things that are happening and to hear you guys honestly from my heart you guys are so brave you are all warriors and heroes that have overcome so many difficult journeys and having a like having everybody together today in our casa it makes me feel really um that you know you can you can achieve anything and from the most horrible tragedy like the hopkins went through you know these these second chances in life these beautiful new lives that you guys have been able to to build um really are so inspiring and and i thank you everyone for sharing this um pong has to he just told me he's gonna have to leave very soon we thank you pong thank you so much for being with us today you're an inspiration and we're gonna Continue seeing your growth and everything you're, you're you're doing to pay forward. Thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, have a good day, everyone. Yeah, you Thank you'll be you. you'll be hearing from me. God bless you. You're a Thank miracle, you. like like yeah. Miss Monica said. You are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah. And so also, it's my honor to present, uh, introduce Mr. Andy Prosper. He's gonna be sharing with us uh, his journey of um, transplantation and donation. I want to mention very quick um, something that we all know very well, but I want to, and, and I know Carlos touched up on that too, there's over 110,000 people in the waiting list in the USA waiting for an organ transplant to have a second chance in life, just like these wonderful people that we have here. Every 10 minutes, one patient is added to that waiting list. And, you know, every day about 22 people, sadly, die waiting for an organ they never receive. And so this is something that we need to keep in mind and keep talking about this, keep sparking the conversation and encouraging our friends and family to, and to register as organ donors. We are here from different ethnicities. We all have different beliefs and cultures. And it's important that we break those myths and those barriers that sometimes we can have you know, as a Latino, I, I have to admit it, we have so many myths and misconceptions, so it's important that we talk about that. So I wanted to um, introduce me, Mr. Andy Trosper and, and that he's gonna be sharing his story with us today. Thank you for allowing me to participate uh, in this event here today. Um, when I became involved in donation, I quickly learned that it is a miracle that donation and transplantation process works. Um, there are so many events that happen at a donor hospital. Then through the uh, gift of hope in my case, but the uh, organ uh, uh, institution that's, that's involved. And then a third time, it all has to happen in the reverse with the transplanting hospital. And all of that happens under duress and under time limits. And so truly, it is a miracle that transplantation works. Uh, I'm here as a recipient, but without a gift from a donor, I'm not here. Donations and transplants change many lives, not just one or two. One successful transplant affects and changes hundreds of lives. My donor changed many people's lives. He certainly changed mine. He changed many others also, as his family has actually heard from nine different recipients. Donor families are truly the heroes in this whole process. My donor family was approached by the gift of hope. They were informed about the choice they could make. They could turn that tragedy into an opportunity to save somebody else's lives. Thankfully, they said yes. I am now 10 years post-transplant. I have not been back to the doctor or hospital other than for annual visits since the day I was released from the hospital. Pre-transplant, I battled liver disease for 18 years. I had been infected through a tainted blood transfusion for a minor surgery with hepatitis C. So you can see that 
it, it truly does impact many people. But now the story really gets better from my perspective because of my transplant. I no longer have a hereditary blood disease. My transplant cured that after 55 years. And after completing a drug therapy for the cure of the hepatitis C, I no longer have that virus. So this journey has been a miracle in my life in many ways. And I give thanks to God for his gift of life to me. And each day truly is a gift. I thank God and my donor family, the talented medical staff, and the loving support of my wife and daughters and family. But I also thank the gift of hope and the hospital ICU staff who approached my donor family, a family who had just suffered the loss of their 16-year-old son and grandson. If not for the dedication and skill of people like these, none of this would be possible. People like you and my donor family members who decided to make sure they would make one final gift to someone like me, an unknown person just wanting to be, have a normal life. This support I received has made my journey remarkable. My faith has strengthened me and kept me grounded and focused on the important things in life. My family supported me when they were so exhausted they did not want to. Family, faith, and support groups are important contribu contributors for successful results. And as you have heard, I do know my donor family, and I cannot express what that means to me. There is no way to express your gratitude. Thank you is just inadequate. I know that I am living because of their decision, and I try to live to make them proud of that decision, for I know how great their loss was as they lost their young son. And it is difficult to know that someone else lost their life and I benefit from that. Fortunately, I know I did nothing to cause that loss of life, and I was given the gift of life as a result. The gift of life being the greatest sacrifice one can make and also the greatest blessing one can receive. But organ and, organ and tissue donation is a wonderful gift to those of us who receive it. It sustains, prolongs, and enhances our lives and it allows us to participate in many meaningful life events as you've heard today. We would not be a part of without of it. Since my, my transplant, I've been able to walk both of my daughters down the aisle at their weddings. Without this gift, I would not have been a part of either ceremony. We celebrated two weddings within 10 months, and I've been able to see both of my daughters receive their master's degrees. And in April, my wife and I celebrated 43 years of marriage. But now we are experiencing the next generation of joy also after becoming grandparents seven years ago. We now have three grandsons, and none of them have inherited my blood disease. God has truly blessed our family. Donation acts as a healing device for those who have lost their loved ones also. There is no way to mask the darkness of that time, but do organ donation can be a way to know that something positive has happened and their loved one lives on. Donation is a comfort to, their fam to the involved family. When I asked my donor's father what made him agree to donation, he simply said, it's the right thing to do. But above all else, donations and transplants all start here with people like you, people supporting donation. Your work will affect people and families in the most difficult times of their lives and help to create miracles. Your efforts are appreciated by everyone you touch and even more that you don't. So thank you for letting me be a part of this today. Thanks. Thank you so much. What an inspiring story. Um, you are absolutely right. What we do every single day um, is so important. And donation and transplantation um, do not just affect the people involved, but so many others. And again, that is why it's so important for us to educate about the importance and the need of uh, transplantation. Thank you all again. Um, for sharing your stories. Your stories are so inspiring and they really demonstrate why transplantation and donation is so beautiful. Uh, we really appreciate you. Um, we would like to open it up now uh, for questions. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat box um, or you can unmute yourself and um, ask your question. Any questions? Don't be shy.
Very good. Well, if we don't have any questions, um, I hope that you all have been inspired as much as I have um, been today. I do a lot of community outreach um, and speak to a lot of people and events like this uh, make me realize um, why I do what I do, why I love what I do, and what a difference we make on a daily basis. So thank you so much for inspiring me, inspiring everybody else. Um, as many have said today, if you're not already registered, um, I encourage you to register at, uh, today at registerme.org. Um, and please have a conversation with your family. This is something that is so important to have that conversation um, with your family, whether your decision is to donate or not to donate. Um, it is so important to have that decision. Um, you can leave a lasting legacy behind like so many that we have talked to today have. And, um, you know, with the more than, you know, 110,000 people that are currently waiting on the list, just saying yes, um, whether you're, you're renewing your driver's license or, or going onto the website, you're giving hope to, to those people that are, that are waiting for that donation. So we thank you again. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, we'll see you all soon. Be well, everybody. Thank you. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, David and Bridget. Happy weekend.